Thanks so much, Laura. And thanks to everybody for joining us this afternoon to talk about what we think is a pretty important um, and sometimes complex topic for life sciences companies. So um, before we dive in, I'm going to just do a short introduction of each of our panelists. I encourage you all to go and read their full bios on the platform um, for the conference, but I know that we are pressed for time, so I'm just going to give you a sense of who they are. So our first participant is Jack Garvey. Jack is the founder and CEO of Compliance Architects LLC, which is a consulting and advisory firm specializing in innovative quality regulatory and compliance solutions for FDA regulated manufacturers. He's both a chemical engineer and a practicing attorney, and he helps life sciences companies navigate complex issues and challenges found at the intersection of science, engineering, business, and law. Michael Swit is the Chief Regulatory Counsel at Varian Medical Systems and has been addressing critical U.S. food and drug legal and regulatory issues since 1984. Before Varian, he served for three years at Illumina Inc. as its Chief Regulatory Counsel, and before that he was in private practice at a number of law firms as well as serving for seven years as a Vice President at the Weinberg Group. And then last but not least, Susie Trigg leads Haynes Boone's team of business-focused FDA attorneys. Susie helps companies manage risk while developing and marketing FDA-regulated consumer products with an emphasis on foods and dietary supplements. In addition to providing prevention-focused regulatory guidance, Susie leads a range of sophisticated commercial transactions and provides focused support for securities offerings and mergers and acquisitions, which leads us directly to our discussion today. So we are going to kick off today's discussion with Jack to sort of set the stage for us about why diligence matters in the life sciences space. Excellent. Thank you, Maya. Um, give me one second to share my slides and we will get going. Uh, please do a, there we go. Can everybody see that in full screen? Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jack Garvin. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you today to talk about um, quality compliance due diligence analysis for FDA regulated company transactions. Um, Maya was kind enough to give me a brief introduction. And so if you're interested, you can certainly look at the slides for more information. Um, but more importantly, what are we gonna cover today? So I've got a two part challenge and part one, uh, I'm gonna spend about five minutes on. I'm gonna move pretty quickly through the slides. You know, th that's kind of my philosophy to give you a lot of information, but we don't have time to go over everything. You can look at the slides. I'm first going to cover in this part one, why is quality compliance due diligence important? And I'm going to talk a little bit about, or mostly about um, a very, I think, um, important case um, for due diligence in the regulated space called Acorn and Fresenius. And also talk a little bit about Theranos. Um, even though it's not a due diligence um, situation, it does provide um, situational and contextual challenges that are pertinent to due diligence. In part two, um, after uh, Michael goes through clinical and regulatory, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, effective quality compliance due diligence reviews. So I want to start out with um, just, again, we're, we're, the topic is why does due diligence matter? And, and the real reason is that mergers can fail and due diligence can fail. And I think it's really important that the stakeholders in company transactions recognize that because um, very sophisticated companies like the ones you see here have had mergers and acquisitions that just didn't go well. Um, uh, so um, I'm sorry. And, and these are only public deal failures, meaning there are likely many um, merger and acquisition failures that we've never heard about, right? That assumptions were bad, that, that the end results, the end objectives didn't work out. And, and, to be perfectly honest, that's part of the due diligence process. Um, in a, uh, actually, I'm going to skip that. Okay. So the one of the primary topics I wanted to talk about today was the Acorn Fresenius merger litigation. And I've, I've used this in a couple different contexts, in the context of data integrity, but also in the due diligence context. And um, uh, basically, uh, it's data integrity goes to court. Now, why, why is this such an important uh, litigation? Well, there is not that many litigations that really have due, uh, due diligence and, and transactional, um, uh, uh, transactional kind of um, uh, importance of the due diligence process 
as a central focus of litigation. Um, and secondly, the litigation really highlights in a very graphical manner um, some of the details and risks that that should have been identified during due diligence. Um, so what happened here is um, uh, Fresenius had an interest in um, uh, the in Acorn uh, Pharmaceutical back in 2016. Uh, they conducted due diligence in 2017, and unfortunately, um, they got into a litigation in 2018. Um, and we're going to kind of go, and there were a, a number of collateral effects and downstream effects from that litigation. And by the way, the litigation was uh, conducted in the Delaware Court of Chancery, uh, Delaware Court of Chancery and Jurisdiction. And um, there was a fairly significant public record. I do not know if that's still available, but um, all of the things I'm going to share with you are were public record at a certain point of time. So the litigants, um, as I said, Acorn was the target of a merger pursuit, pursuit and it is the plaintiff in the litigation. Um, they were a company worth about 1.2 billion in 2016. Fresenius Kabi was a German company. They pursued the merger and they were essentially looking to acquire Acorn's pipeline. They were a $39 billion company. So these individual companies were not were very sophisticated parties to a transaction. Um, so what was the overview of the dispute? Um, the, well, the Fresenius, again, um, uh, made an intent to purchase primarily based on their company's pipeline. Uh, due diligence um, was conducted in February to April in 2017. And this is something that, you know, honestly, having done due diligence, I don't do transactional work, that it really actually took me a while to figure out that due diligence occurs after a contract uh, or before a contract generally is signed. And what that means is there isn't a there there is a there's not a huge amount of transparency that occurs in that setting. So and, and this really gets to the essence of what some of the issues are and something I think needs to think about. And I'll actually ask questions of of Maya and Susie later. Is there any other way to do this? But they conducted a due diligence again or under under terms, but not under contract terms, February to April. They negotiated and signed terms in April based on that with a purchase price from Frazinus to Acorn of $4.75 billion. And the uh, chief executive at Frazinius stated after the announcement, we performed a detailed due diligence, had access to a comprehensive data room, held countless um, uh, expert sessions, and were able to address all of our questions have con and concerns. Have we, looked, have we overlooked anything material? Possibly, but unlikely. So remember that. Ten months post due diligence, um, there were two written whistleblower ac uh, allegations sent to Fresenius from someone in Acorn alleging fraud and massive data integrity failures across Acorn. There were follow-on investigations by Fresenius, um, and and when I do this in other contexts, I I put a uh, a slide of the parties. There were numerous consultants, numerous law firms, many of the firms that are uh, likely in attendance at this conference. There were many sophisticated participants in this set of investigations and assessments of ACORN after these whistleblower allegations were occurred. So the follow-on investigations um, raised significant doubt relative to ACORN's compliance risks. And the questions in the dispute were, was what was identified by Fresenius relative to data integrity within ACORN considered material as that term is defined under the terms of the merger agreement? And would the data integrity issues either in individually or in the aggregate be reasonably expected to have a material adverse effect? And that's a term of art that Susie and I'm sure Maya are more familiar with um, uh, on the business results or operations uh, taken as a whole. Um, now, in the merger agreement, there is uh, generally a customary right of reasonable access post uh, transaction. Um, and that really is as I understand it, intended in, uh, for issues that arise between signing and closing. The issue here was this um, data, in data integrity issue was raised during that period, but that is not where the genesis of those issues occurred. They were, ex they were pre-existing due diligence and they were certainly pre-existing the contract term. So I share this really as more of a, um, some of the, the impacts that I'm gonna talk about um, there was a significant uh, court opinion on this. Um, it was a five-day trial. It took place from July 9th to the 13th in 2018. 
The parties introduced 1,892 exhibits and lodged 54 deposition transcripts, 40 from fact witnesses and 14 from experts. Nine fact witnesses and seven experts testified live at trial. The court opinion was 247 pages, and the opinion is replete with highly embarrassing details that most companies would never want to see the light of day. And I think this is really one of the most significant aspects of this. Um, I read the court opinion, and it was just shocking to see details that I work with companies on all the time that were out in a matter of public record. No company um, on either side of this transaction would want to have these sorts of details vetted in a public forum. Um, the, the judge was very, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the judge in this case, um, brilliant judge, his opinion was brilliant, was very um, uh, uh, animated in his um, discussion, uh, but he basically felt that, of course, these were material when viewed from a longer term perspective of a reasonable acquirer. Um, and this was the first time in the Delaware Court of Chancery um, that a court voided a merger agreement for conduct triggering the material adverse effect of contractual termination provisions. So what were the impacts here? Well, there were a lot of impacts and it was um, uh, as much, it was mostly on the target side, but there were certainly impacts on the acquirer side. Um, at the start of due diligence, um, the share price, uh, I can't see over here, I've got to minimize this. The share price for Acorn was somewhere on the 20s. Um, after the merger was announced, it got up into $30, $32 a share. Uh, once we had whistleblower allegations, we can see a drop in share price down to around the 20s again. Um, once we started an investigation, there was further drop into the commencement of litigation, into trial, decision and order. And uh, this was in 2018, um, and it resulted in an Acorn share price of approximately three to four dollars a share. Um, so as I said, the original purchase price was 4.7 billion. Today's share price, or as of a couple of days ago, it's three cents a share for Acorn. Um, this, you know, killed the company in essence. But Fresenius was not alone in its share price impact. Uh, in January of 2018, Fresenius was a uh, $57.50 .50 company. Um, in 2018, they dropped about six or seven points. Um, uh, later uh, in 2018, they dropped to about 40 points, and now they're even down below. Now, that may be for COVID and a lot of things, but there was an impact to Fresenius, too. This was a, uh, a blight on Fresenius and certainly impacted the share price. So, you know, what are some of the costs? Well, there were, um, if you would have seen the consultants um, and the lawyers that were involved, there are extensive uh, fees for data integrity reviews, for remediation. There are fees for expert witnesses, lawyer fees for litigation. I think the biggest thing is destruction of reputation. The Acorn CEA was terminated and replaced, business distraction, massive loss of shareholder value. You know, so what are some things to consider here is that due diligence in the quality and compliance space can be critical, not just to the transaction, um, but to both companies' financial results. And particularly if the deal goes south and litigation ensues, which I don't know how often that happens, but based on the fact that deals do go south, as we saw, I, I have to believe, uh, you know, I don't do that side, but, you know, there's probably a good amount of it. So quality and compliance due diligence, and we'll talk about this in part two, looks at products, data, systems. It's complicated. It's multidimensional and it's interconnected. And it's really difficult to objectively characterize things like culture, capability, and risk. And finally, assumptions that are incorrect in the space can be financially devastating to long-term success, um, product commercialization, product liability enforcement, um, there are significant outcomes to not doing this properly. And finally, um, before I uh, uh, turn it back over to Maya, uh, talk a little bit about Theranos. Now, there is a session going on um, at 2.15 on the Theranos uh, case. Um, and really what I wanted to bring to, to highlight is the following. Um, so I think we all know Theranos raised a lot of money from sophisticated investors. A company valuation at peak was over $9 billion. It has been established um, that the company officers lied to board members, fostered a culture of intimidation and secrecy, promoted technology that failed quality assurance, and actually delivered results to real patients that were fundamentally incorrect. I found a, a June 2014 article that shows some of the, um, the, 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 um, the curtain behind which Theranos operated and says precisely how Theranos accomplishes all these amazing feats is a trade secret. 
Holmes will only say, and this is more than she's ever said before, that her company uses the same fundamental chemical methods as, as, as existing labs do. It relates to optimizing chemi chemistry and leveraging software. So again, although this is not a due diligence failure, this is a company that could have been looked at for an acquisition. So what are some takeaways? You know, although you may miss acquiring the first mover of being the next big thing, being skeptical may, may keep you from losing your shirt and destroying a successful company as an acquirer. Um, I think the second takeaway is people lie, cheat, and steal uh, and do wrong things all the time. There's a whole show about it called American Greed on CNBC. Um, due diligence is about finding those things that not only can detract from realize, realizing the upside of deal value, but that also can it derail a company's business. And finally, the more sophisticated and complicated the science, the greater the possibility that the seed or fraud will be difficult to find. In other words, the claim of scientific complexity is a great camouflage for deceit, as we see in the Theranos matter. Sorry. And finally, uh, just some deals that were impacted by FDA quality issues. I I am not an expert on any of these deals, but there have been a few in our space, uh, other than the Fresenius and Acorn, um, that have had issues and that have resulted in impacts to companies as a result of quality issues and, by implication, the due diligence process. So with that, um, that is my introduction on why, and I'll talk a little bit about how to approach this in part two. Maya? Thanks so much, Jack. Um I'm going to turn it over to Susie now to talk a little bit about sort of at a high level um, as much as we can in, in just a short time, sort of how to approach diligence in this space. Thank you so much, Maya and Jack, for your remarks. Uh, Jack is absolutely right that the due diligence for a deal um, can help determine whether or not there's an absolute deal stopper. And it can also have the impact of just helping day-to-day -day a company figure out whether or not there are issues that are going to require attention uh, post-closing. So now that we've seen just how wrong things can go if there's not sufficient due diligence, let's talk about how to ensure that your due diligence efforts directed at FDA-regulated products and companies are actually effective. And by effective, we don't mean that you should find a deal stopper issue or issues because most of the time, about 99%, maybe more, the deal will go on. And if you find something you need effective recourse post-closing, that's not litigation because as Jack points out, then a lot of information is available in the public domain. And so you might be wondering why there is a penguin skating around at the bottom of this slide. So it's winter, and it's a couple of weeks before the holidays, and so he's very cute, and there's that. But also, ice skating, while it's very common, um, and if it's done well, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of planning to execute well. For example, you need the right equipment. You need the right conditions on the ice. And most of the time, it'll be uneventful if you have those things. But if not, you can end up with a bad landing or a severe injury. And this is a lot the same way. So that doesn't make what's easy or looks easy most of the time be easy necessarily, but it usually it can be done well. So moving on from our dancing penguin, let's talk about when due diligence happens. I think there is a broad kind of misconception that most due diligence occurs in connection with mergers and acquisitions. That's what we hear about. That's what we think about. When you have an M&A transaction, one of the first questions will be, what is the due diligence going to look like? And where's our forms? And how do we get a virtual data room set up so that everybody has the information? And well, that's a very good context to talk about with due diligence. It's also broader, right? If an issuer of securities is going to do an offering, there's going to be diligence on that company. There's going to be a uh, pretty significant diligence both by the issuer's counsel and the underwriter's counsel to determine what exactly should be in the filings and the disclosures. Lenders often are taking a closer and closer look at the FDA regulated companies with which they do business. Uh, those who are investing should be doing thorough due diligence or at least as thorough as the amount of the investment in the context allows. Leasing, we see landlords who will look at a company's operations, an FDA-regulated company's operations, to determine whether or not the company is likely to be able to meet its obligations. And also, in the context of cannabis businesses, we've certainly seen that landlords have taken a close look at whether or not they will be adversely impacted by doing business with the company. 
And then also for in-license transactions and collaboration agreements, both parties want to be assured that there's good transparency and they understand what they're getting into. So while I move on in just a minute to how to conduct effective due diligence, I wanted to pause for just a minute to talk also about the information that FDA regulated industry should be cataloging and thinking about making available. So if you realize that the technology that you're working on getting approved by FDA is if approved or perhaps prior to approval but later stage likely to be acquired by a third party, the company can start thinking early about the types of documents the third party will request the type of access to facilities they might request, and how to get things in order that uh, might be needed later. So you could think of it almost as if you are going to have a house and you're later going to have to fill out seller disclosures if you sell that house, how are you going to effectively document that, for example, repairs after a major flood were made the correct way? So for FDA-regulated industry, the way we counsel a lot of clients is it's not necessarily that you won't have had problems. Most companies are going to have some hiccups along the way. Um, it's more, did you effectively resolve the concern? And if you effectively resolved it, can you document factually, not in privileged documents, but factually, that the problem has been resolved in a way that a prospective investor or buyer could later see, look at, or get a feel for to get comfortable with the transaction? So, and then the last kind of point here that I have is that due diligence is not a, it's not a one-sided type effort. It's uh, usually to be very effective. It involves both legal counsel to keep in mind things like privilege and to look at documents. It involves consultants like Jack and his group to actually go into facilities and really get a feel for the culture of the company and for what they're actually doing day to day for compliance and then other experts as needed. You know, you may find yourself with microbiologists in food facilities or someone looking at levels of allergens, things like that. You may need other experts too. So it's about having a good team ready. So if we're thinking about effective due diligence um, and the examples that Jack brought up, both of those, you have to think about what kind of fell apart there or really fell apart there is that the due diligence, either case, whether it was by investors or by an acquirer, did it really get to whether or not there was a culture of compliance? And so not just facts and figures and past issues, but also is there a trend that might predict future hurdles or predict where things will ultimately head for a company? And then also insight about practical steps that a company can take post-closing to reduce risk. Um, one of the things that I like about a well-written due diligence summary prepared by attorneys and consultants working together is that it can operate as a very effective post-closing checklist for what could be done to bolster the company and address areas of concern that are found during due diligence. Because typically, even if it is a um, company that thinks it's done everything right, having third parties take a look at operations, compliance, and documentation, there's seldom not anything to be done. There can usually be a risk the company hasn't seen very well or something another party says can be done a bit better. And so when you've conducted effective diligence, it should also have the impact of providing a pretty good working list post-closing. And then finally, and I think this part really bears highlighting, a good and effective due diligence for an FDA-regulated product or company, it won't just simply say, here's a risk and there's a risk. The FDA could issue a warning letter. The FDA has issued warning letters on this point, or perhaps we could be looking at an import detention on these products for this point. A, an effective due diligence will really allow the, uh, the team that is in control of the deal or the team that is actually working on the business transaction, whichever it will be, uh, to quantify the risk and formulate a strategy to address it. There are a lot of different ways that deals can be saved or investments can be saved by working through what the risk actually means. Not that it's just there, right? But what does it actually mean, short term, longer term, and how it can be addressed? So when we think about due diligence, um, I always think about development of the toolkit before due diligence being one of the most important aspects of this. And so, you know, talked a moment ago about the team, right? It's not just 
one team looking at papers. It's usually a variety of experts. So keeping in mind various teams for various types of FDA-regulated um, products is helpful. And then also having starting points. So the one thing that I think my co-panelists will probably find as true as I do is that the timeline for how long there is to con conduct effective FDA due diligence and get a deal done does not depend on what the FDA attorney or FDA regulatory consultant says it should depend on, right? These timelines are not our timelines. They're business-driven timelines. They are stock market-driven timelines. And therefore, in order to conduct effective due diligence and really get to the finish line, there are two things that are going to be very important. The first is the toolkit that you walk in with. And second is your scoping and planning and communications at the front of the deal. And so we think about having a toolkit. It's starting points for key deal documents. And, you know, our team has kind of developed a pretty extensive library of these over time, right? If you want to have a general acquisition of a medical device company and they have 510K clear products, there's a list for that. There's a set of documents for that. If you want to have an offering and involves an early stage company that hopes to have approved biologics and vaccines, well, there's a different set for that. And so you have these documents ready really takes away the time pressure and also allows the team that is working on the due diligence and the team that is working on the underlying transaction, the time and space to identify and address the real issues. Um, you definitely don't want to take your qualified team members off of due diligence to draft basic reps and warranties or to go through old deal documents and look for reps and warranties when you could have a working set that you um, have in your file already and can work from. And so these are just a few of the, you know, kind of toolkit things that we like to have available. Now, on what you don't have while I'm talking about a toolkit is just one mindset. You know, if it's a fixed mindset, this is our list, this is what we request, this is what we look at, then we're going to have our consultant fly in for two days and conduct an eight-hour assessment. We're not going to call it an audit, just an eight-hour assessment followed by a one-hour phone call, followed by a brief written report, and there we go, and maybe we'll put a few things on disclosure schedules. That probably isn't going to catch the uncommon, but still out there, company where you really do have to have a radar for things that are really going amiss. And so, for example, I, um, I will say that I never I get irritated if I hear from one of my team members that they've spent eight hours going down a, a, a trail of social media postings because of the insight that they can gain about players or about how a company is really marketing its products and where they're going, right? It's not actually even, I think, anywhere in our template documents or lists. Um, that will spend that kind of time on that kind of a trail. But if we see something, you have to be willing to go after it and to really trail it down to the end as much as time allows. And then the other thing to exclude is quick conclusions without the right information. Um, I think this one frustrates me more than anything. Um, we'll get this call and, you know, it's um, like anything good in this space. It comes in either at 4 or 5 o'clock on a Friday or maybe it's 10 p.m. just before a holiday. And someone is trying to get a deal done, but they've jumped to a conclusion they, on an area they don't know quite enough about without enough information. And that's the type of issue that can really threaten to derail a deal. So, for example, if you um, go pretty far with information in the data room suggesting, I'll use where I'm very comfortable, that a food company had a positive for a pathogenic bacteria, but then someone jumps at the last minute of the deal to go, wait a second, the FDA's reportable food registry wasn't reported. And then that type of information where somebody had looked at it previously and said that should have not been an issue, not worried about it, and they kind of got a conclusion in their report and moved on, somebody else might second guess later and they missed the opportunity um, because there was an early conclusion to really look at the issue thoroughly while there was still time to do that. So again, initial planning and setting expectations. This is a nuts and bolts part of due diligence, but I think for an FDA regulated company or product, it's particularly important. You have to obtain a very broad 
overview of the company. The confidential information memorandum is a great place to start an M&A transaction, but also if you're thinking about this from a perspective of, you know, your the team that's asking you to conduct the due diligence may or may not know exactly what's important and what you'll be looking for. It's also going and finding um, adverse event reports, it's finding warning letters, it's finding pest recalls, and really gathering a broad perspective of where a company has come from and what it's doing. And then conducting a high-level review of products to ensure that you've captured everything that's in development and in market, and perhaps even things that didn't get approved or just fell by the wayside. And then setting the scope um, based on the time and resources available. And um, time constraints are very real. Resource constraints are very real. And so you really need to have both, again, the paper review plus the in-person review where it's possible or something that goes beyond paper and getting the scope right so that you have time to do that, but not derail the rest of the transaction if you find a problem that needs to be addressed is very important and critical. And then you have to take that initial plan for due diligence, the scope. Here's what we would cover. Here's what we might leave behind, right? You've given us four weeks. You've given us six weeks. If we only have four to six weeks, if we find X, we're not going to be addressed by doing Y, or we may not actually get to issue Z because there's not enough time. And so we have to make sure that we, the scope and the timeline are in sync and that it's in sync with the overall transaction. Um, the timing of when the due diligence can occur, you know, is, is something that uh, Jack mentioned and we might get back to some more, but I mean, there may be a couple of stages of diligence, right? Pre-LOI diligence, and then there's a contract phase, contract negotiation diligence that's tied to reps and warranties and disclosures, and there may be also a post-signing diligence period if there are some closing deliverables. And so it can be split up if you work closely with the deal makers. So before I pass this back over to Michael, I wanted to go through a quick example. Um, this one is one of those, I intentionally loaded it up, but you'd be surprised how often a deal comes in that looks some variation of just like this. Here you have a foreign company that markets consumer products that on the surface look maybe a bit innocuous, right? They're just intended to better the lives of children and adults that struggle with executive functioning, focus and concentration, impulsivity, and sleep. So the first thing you're looking at is a food product, right? They have a raw focus bar. And then they also have dream gummies labeled as dietary supplements. And then they have jewelry for sensory solutions. And then they have wiggle wobbles, a line of pillows and chairs that's intended to help. And then they also have a compound that they're studying called EF911. They've let you know, they've proudly announced that it's just entered clinical study. And then finally, they have a, an EEG that they're very excited about the use of it to better diagnose ADHD. And that's also something for which they're going to pursue FDA clearance. And so as you look at this bundle of products, the first thing is I think the temptation of a lot of FDA attorneys pretty early on would say food, that's us, supplement, that's us, compound that's under study, that's definitely us, we need some healthcare attorneys too, and then finally medical device, that's us. But I intentionally threw the couple of, you know, are they red herrings or are they not, um, devices in here. Uh, always looking at with the angle of a consumer products company, at least taking an initial pass to make sure they're not saying the jewelry is a cure for focus or the wiggle wobble chairs uh, will also treat this disease, right? Just making sure that those kinds of claims aren't thrown in there. Uh, but with a project like this, the reason I chose to highlight something quite this complex is because this is one where perhaps we can get a time later to talk more about the specific elements, but you would need multiple, uh, a, a, again, that multifaceted team, right? You're going to want someone who can look at the manufacturing facility uh, for food to see whether or not they're manufacturing those products and under a good working food safety plan, you're going to want someone looking at whether or not they have an adequate foreign supplier verification program for those bars. And then you're going to also want someone else who is just as qualified to look at the dream gummies, the dietary supplements. Our, our structure function claims both substantiated with competent, reliable scientific evidence and also not walking too close to the line of being drug claims. 
And then you're going to want someone to take a look at the clinical study. Did they have they submitted their IND? Did they do that correctly? And also finally the, the device, right? Have they picked the appropriate pathway for an EEG because there are several available? And so this is one where likely any team that worked on it would need to supplement their team or augment their team. And so you'd want to carefully document those relationships to ensure that ultimately it's funneling into a report that's privileged that is to the investor and that there's not too much information shared back and forth through channels where um, it doesn't necessarily belong or shouldn't be shared. And so this is where you can see in something if you had this type of transaction come along that having starting point for a toolkit would be important, but also the willingness to really understand the company and where the risks are because with a company such as this one, as you guys can tell, there would be disclosures. There would probably be line item indemnification, and there would probably be even perhaps excluded assets or liabilities, um, depending on the nature of the overall transaction to ensure that, again, the transaction goes as well as possible, and you end up with looking like this at the end, as though it's all easy, I, rather than fumbling around and falling in the middle of the transaction. So with that, I will pass it over to Michael. Thank you, Susie. And um, if I recall correctly, uh, someone's gonna be running my slides for me. Thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Uh, if you could put this in slideshow mode, that might be. Um, so uh, a couple comments before I get into well, what I'm going to do um, that I'd like to riff off of uh, both uh, Susie and Jack. Uh, first of all, um, I, I think Susie, uh, and, and Susie uh, had a uh, point on her slide. She actually didn't mention it, but you're going to see when I get into my slides that I'm going to be focusing to some extent um, on uh, what is the products, what is, where is the products at in, in, their, in particular stages. Um, so um, in development, are they preclinical? Uh, are they uh, in the, you know, submission at clinical stage? Are they post-market, et cetera? So those are those things that you have to look at very carefully. Um, two comments. Uh, I think Susie gave a really good overview of some of the considerations. One of the things that I've found in my career is that, um, and before I get into talking about uh, regulatory clinical the, uh, if particularly at companies, what happens is you have a, a, a development team or a pro, you know corporate development, whatever your department is that focuses on acquiring companies or acquiring products. Uh, they get involved in these things, and then it's only maybe two, three, maybe even five or six months later after they've done a lot of courting and uh, talked to the uh, the target company or the target product that they come. Oh, by the way, w regulatory and clinical and quality. We take a look at this stuff. And I think that's really, really uh, a dangerous practice. You need to get people involved really early. Because uh, you may have something happen like uh, happened to me at one, uh, one, you know, in my career, is um, they came to me, they were thinking about acquiring a company, and as it turned out, coincidentally, this particular company had changed its name. Um, and in a previous iteration, I actually had, had significant exposure to this company's technology, and I had some very key questions about whether it was particularly viable. Uh, I didn't say it didn't work, but it was, you know, it was one of those things just kind of like Theranos. It was kind of like, this is too good to be true. Um, and often when things are too good to be true. So it really needs to involve your regulatory, clinical, and quality people, particularly in your, if you're at a company. Get them involved early. Because uh, they can look at the, you know, the regulatory strategies and give you an early view, view as to whether this is going to be. Because what happens is once you get further down the road, what I worry about is what I call the heat of the deal. People are just so, they think it's the, the greatest thing since sliced bread. And another comment, uh, Susie's uh, example I think is really good. But one of the things I would say is you also need to look at that bottle, that, you know, that uh, plethora of different product lines and say, where is the money? Uh, you know, it may be that the uh, the gummies is where all the money is. So, uh, you know, you may not, so your due diligence may have to focus on where, what are the product lines. 
And what that money may be what it is in New Zealand may not be what the market in uh, the United States will bear. So, and then finally, I'd like to comment, and, and Susie alluded to this, um, uh, Jack, I, I, I hate to argue with you, but I do sometimes. Uh, I think you said Theranos is really not a due diligence example, but it actually really is, because if you look at those investors, what due diligence did they do? You know, they just uh, got, uh, you know, at the risk of sounding flippant, uh, you know, um, Ms. Ms. Holmes batted her eyes at them and uh, impressed her with uh, them with their, her uh, Steve Jobs type uh, demeanor, and they thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. They had no idea what was in the bread. Um, so so uh, going out on some more practical uh, things, and what I've done here is I've kind of blended regulatory and clinical. So if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, which is my standard disclaimers. Uh, I'll skim over them, uh, but uh, these are my views. Um, also, uh, I'm going to say some things that aren't in the slides, so please don't rely solely on the slides. And uh, this is general educational information, uh, not intended to convey legal advice. If you uh, a lawyer for this stuff, uh, if you're not aware of yourself, um, there's some great this panel and elsewhere in the FDLI. Next slide. So as I highlighted, what you need to know will vary depending on the stage of development. So some of the things here, and uh, I'm not going to go into how you do this because I think we've heard a little bit about that already, but you need to focus on validating the regulatory strategy. So what type of products involved? How is it regulated? Is it really a device if the primary mode of action is a biologic? And this is one I actually dealt with some years ago when I was uh, in private practice. We had, and this came up basically in, in an investment situation where we were representing a, a company that was going to be investing in another company. And the company uh, said, well, we've got this product, um, and it was a combination product. Uh, and uh, they thought, uh, and it involved running blood through a uh, almost like a kidney dialysis machine, um, and uh, there was a biologic on a filter in there that would be able to cleanse uh, cholesterol from the blood. Well, it turns out that they thought they were going to go do a 510K, and I looked at this, and I said to uh, the partner I was working with, I said, you know what? The, you got this big device. It looks like a device, but what's really doing, what's the magic, the secret sauce here is the biologic. That's what's actually cleansing the cholesterol. So they thought they were going to be in the center for devices. And this was way before FDA had uh, worked out in more detail how it handles combination products. But they were going to be in this probably, but we're going to be in the center for biologics. So um, what about something that looks like a drug but has no metabolic activity? Will FDA consider it a, a device? We've seen controversies here with, uh, you know, ultrasound contrast agents. Um, hyaluronic acid is another example of that. So you really need to make sure you understand what the regulatory pathway is. Another one, you got a great idea for a product. Will FDA take this as a 505B2 NDA? And do you understand in there what the gaps are between uh, what you're going to rely on from the, from the uh, reference listed drug and what you're going to have to do uh, to substantiate that? So a good example that you may not have focused on, but you're going to take a product that's uh, uh, already on the market for a, a, an acute use and you want to use it for a chronic use, you're going to be looking at a bunch of the new toxicology studies that they may not have focused on. Um, uh, this is looking into the preclinical stage. What type of, you know, looking into what type of proof of concept principle studies have they done? Did they use that validated animal models? Next slide, please. Now we get into the sort of the clinical trials world. We're in the pre-approval. You know, did they meet with FDA? And if they didn't, that that's a red flag in my view anyway. Uh, whether it be pre-IND meeting or pre-sub on the device side, did they? What what happened at their end of phase two meeting? You need to, you know, obviously these are the types of documents you need to read. Are the study designs actually consistent with FDA recommendations? Sometimes people will go off and do something they think and, and deviate from what FDA has recommended. Is there a clear agreement on definition of a key indication? I had a client years ago that got into a clinical study, and they were studying chronic sinusitis. Well, it turned out that they never really, and this is after I actually worked with them, so I was not involved with this. They never really 
nailed down what the definition of chronic sinusitis was. So when they went and did their study, it wasn't actually what FDA was expecting. Uh, another key thing is what are the adverse event trends um, that you're looking at? You don't want to have another Vioxx for those who remember, you know, what happened with Vioxx. Excuse me. Uh, good clinical practice compliance. Are there a lot of protocol deviations? These could be red flags that the data may not be uh, stand up to FDA scrutiny. Uh, are they ready to scale up to commercial manufacturing upon approval? They may have done a really good job with, uh, you know, small scale, but are they really going to be able to handle, you know, get approval? And then the demand looks up, uh, you know, are they ready to scale up? Or are they going to have to do uh, a new submission in order to go into uh, more commercial manufacturing? Next slide. Now we're in the market to post approval say have they maintained their applications properly? You know, 510K changes, does the marketed device conform? Uh, have they made the correct analysis under FDA's uh, guidance documents on when you need a new 510K for a change? You know, or are you going to be looking at, uh, to, dr to drag up a, something from earlier in my career, the 69, Medtronic 6970 pacemaker lead issue where they went through, a, they made a lot of changes to a lead uh, using polyurethane, and it turned out that they hadn't validated it very well, and they never submitted 510Ks for, for these changes, uh, and it was a very dangerous issue. Uh, led to congressional hearings. Uh, that's not the kind of uh, thing you want to inherit. Uh, the drug side, is the current manufacturing consistent with approval, uh, or have they drifted? Um, you now, whether that's intentional, uh, we saw early on in the uh, in the days of the early years of the generic drug industry, that there were a lot of companies that were changing their manufacturing and weren't properly supplementing their ANDAs. Or accelerated approval. Where do they stand on their phase four confirmation study commitments? These are all things that you need to look at. Um, next slide, please. Uh, some other things. Are they are, are there key third-party vendors that are being used? Have they been looked at? Uh, API suppliers, is their drug master file up to date? Are there any safety issues such as the bulk heparin issues we saw coming out of China? Are they using a contract manufacturer? If that contract manufacturer is not up to snuff, it can delay your approval. Back in about 2002, um, Cialis, which was then uh, owned by a was being developed by a company in Seattle whose name temporarily escapes me, uh, was delayed a year because they were using actually Lilly as a contract manufacturer and that the Lilly manufacturing facility had major quality issues. Um, so, and, so, and some of these issues I'm raising could be addressed through co uh, contract uh, issues as well. In this case, for example, I would recommend you uh, have the right to have a backup manufacturing facility, but that's not an easy or cheap uh, thing to have in your back pocket. Analytical testing labs, their issues can delay approval. Uh, Jack, you may remember all the time you spent in Montreal on the NDS, uh, which was a contract lab where there were major data integrity issues that delayed a number of ANDAs uh, that were because bioequivalent studies, which are the linchpin of the ANDA process, had been done and data integrity issues were raised. Uh, some of those were salvaged through good audits and some of them couldn't be. Uh, contract research organizations, do they have GCP issues? They could delay or derail your approval. Next slide, please. Some other things that are key to verify is, you know, and these aren't necessarily purely regulatory, but, you know, you need to coordinate regulatory and clinical and your quality people with other parts of your, uh, your, your company, such as are the development plans, the indication for uh, or the formulation is now consistent with your IP position. You don't want to develop a product for which you don't have IP protection, although at the end of the day, you may not have any choice. Maybe the way the, the studies go. Um, are going to lead you in that direction. That's why you always have to enter, you know, and it's not really a, a due diligence issue, but just a, a process issue. You always have to have your IP issue people, your IP legal team working hand in hand with your development people. Have your studies generated the data needed for key reimbursement challenges? It doesn't do a lot of good to get a product approved if you can't get it reimbursed. Have they done the right work on that? Are they developing a 505B2 drug? And will they be able to make enough money before they're exposed to generic competition? If they don't get exclusivity under Waxman Hatch, which typically you can under a 505B2, uh, you're going to have a problem if you don't have strong patents. 
uh, does it even qualify for exclusivity? Um, so um, these are some of the key issues that uh, you need to worry about in the regulatory cl clinical space. Next slide, please. Another couple of few uh, unique issues I've stumbled on along. Who owns the data? Make sure the contracts uh, that they signed uh, provide for control for all data. Uh, so you have a clinical study. We actually, I ran, I ran into some private practice. We had a client that had done a uh, clinical study, and it was kind of a three-way clinical study in which a major university was actually acting as the CRO for the, for the device trial. This was a PMA device. Uh, and so the university had control of all the raw data. Well, they announced uh, that, uh, that about two or three years after the PMA got approved, the um, uh, university announced uh, that they may be releasing the raw data, which it, if had been done, would have uh, allowed a competitor to use that raw data potentially as a, a historical control for their own studies. And you can get the data. There was a company called Oriad in Kansas uh, that uh, did a lot of analytical studies. They went bankrupt. They had all this was way before there was, you know, the cloud. All data data was stored in the cloud. They actually had a lot of physical data, hard copy that was stored in a cave because uh, that made for good storage conditions. But they didn't have any money to retrieve it, and in some, and a lot of uh, companies needed to get their data for FDA submissions. Um, so weird things. Or are you buying a false claim in that case? You know, Pfizer bought Warner Lambert and got stuck with paying the $400 million Neurontin off-label case uh, for a false label, false claims act. So, uh, you know, you can price that into the deal, of course, but uh, you got to make sure you know about it. Um, next slide, please. So I, um, I've taken, I tried to go through this a little quickly. Uh, one other thing I, I would, if I have one second left, uh, is also when you're doing, dealing, doing a deal overseas, make sure you really understand who you're doing business with. So uh, I know a, a situation where a company was going into Kazakhstan, uh, and there were issues raised about uh, the, uh, and they were going to sell a lot of their product in there. Uh, and the company they were working with, uh, there were major issues raised about the integrity of the CEO uh, and whether it was he basically had he committed uh, fraud in a number of other deals. So uh, lots of different things. Uh, Everything is going to be deal specific. Uh, and so uh, thanks for your time. I appreciate the ability to share the, uh, the dais with uh, the virtual dais with all of these learning colleagues. And I'll turn it back over to Maya. Thanks, Michael. So I know we're going to turn back to Jack to talk a little bit about quality issues. I am mindful of time, um, so maybe we can do that quickly just so we have time for a couple of questions among the panel before we lose the audience. I have uh, already um, taken a knife to my slides in the background and we'll try to move. I'm trying to try to do it in two minutes. Um, I, I apologize. There's There's really a lot here, but I, I, we do need to leave time for questions. Um, so I cut a bunch out. Um, one of the things that that um, Susie talked about, um, she mentioned um, her team doing social media research. And, and I'd, I'd uh, lump that into the category. When you're planning a quality compliance due diligence, you need to do a lot of pre-due diligence diligence and substantial pre-research. And I would, I would uh, put that um, social media research and a lot of other things in there. There's a ton of information on the internet. The internet is your friend. Um, you should know as much about the company as possible, anything public, and there's a lot that you can find that isn't public. Uh, you need to, to do that to get a framework that allows you to develop a work plan to get to the issues. Um, you know, in the age of COVID, on-site uh, is um, not always allowable, but the topics we're talking about in quality compliance, which are really operational issues, they are the regulatory framework and operating model that, that overlays manufacturing and commercialization facilities. Paper reviews are not recommended, but if you have to, reserve a right to perform an in-person follow-up audit based on paper review. Develop a work plan um, uh, and, and essentially define a set of objectives and criteria for sufficiency, veracity. Um, so have a plan so that you know what you're gonna look at, you know what you need to 
what criteria you meet, need to meet as you're looking through these issues so that you align expectations with your stakeholders on information um, relative to sufficiency of review, the quality of the information that you're going to convey regarding risk. Um, you know, at the end of the day, as Susie said, um, it's not necessarily that you have problems, but you need to be able to value those problems. And that needs to, you know, everybody needs to be eyes wide open. So these are some focus areas. Um, uh, and uh, these focus areas need to be looked at in the context of, uh, and Susan mentioned, uh, Susie mentioned compliance culture. Uh, we, we generally use the term quality culture in, in my mind for regulated uh, commercial uh, commercialization manufacturing entities, they, they really are the same thing. Um, so all of these, what I'd call focus areas of review need to be done in the context of the culture of the organization relative to quality and compliance. Um, usually in this sort of talks, I go through all of these and they have very specific set of substance. We're, we're not gonna do that today um, because of time. And finally, um, the the, um, uh, the the one last thing I'm going to I'm going to say is that um, for many companies, a company's data is its value. So therefore, data integrity is really value integrity. So if you're going to do nothing else in your review, um, you really need to look at data integrity. This has been an enforcement issue for years now. It's, it goes back. Uh, Michael has schooled me. It goes back to AIP back in the '80s. Um, so it's, it's, an, it's an evergreen topic, but as it relates to due diligence, it's transactional value that really flows from the, the integrity of your data. So hopefully, Maya, I did that quickly enough. Very yeah. impressed, Jack. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. So one thing just to mention, and, and then I, I don't know if we have any audience questions yet, but I have a question or two to ask the panel. Um, just one thing to mention, we don't have time to go into it here with the time we've got left, but just something to bear in mind for the non-lawyers, which is just that the overlay of privilege can really impact sort of how diligence goes and what can be shared. Because as a general matter, courts will not find that privilege, that any sort of common interest privilege exists, certainly pre-signing of your contract, right? In fact, the parties have usually opposing interests at that point in time. So it's pretty hard to argue you have a common interest with your counterparty. Sometimes once you have a signed up deal, you could argue for a common interest in getting towards the, the closing, right? And if issues are disclosed then, but that can really impact, frankly, the ability of, the, of a target and what they're able to disclose and then hamper, you know, what the, what the buyer is able to uncover. So it's just something to be aware of. And oftentimes we sort of have this presumption, I think, amongst non-lawyers that they can just declare some sort of common interest and freely share information. And that's unfortunately not the way it always works. So just something to bear in mind. Um, so one thing that I wanted to just touch on, you know, to keep us sort of timely and Jack, you alluded to this, is really whether and how COVID has impacted things, right? Because obviously the preference is to go on site, to do reviews in person, to have those in-person meetings where you can look people in the eye and get a sense of their commitment to quality and to compliance. And th that has not really been possible in many deals. And yet it's not like we've been allotted more time, you know, so like, okay, you'll just do it all in paper and we'll have long follow-up to Susie's point. Usually the timelines are set in advance and not really uh, malleable. So I'm wondering whether anybody has encountered new challenges or different challenges um, in COVID and sort of as we've moved to a more virtual world. I don't know, Susie, if you wanted to add anything on that. Yeah, I'll say, you know, it, it works both ways. So the challenge of actually getting into a facility and being able to assess the facility is definitely there. The challenge of obtaining records from foreign parties, there are countries that are much more pervasively and extensively shut down than the U.S., that's definitely there too. And so I think, you know, there's, there's a bit of blindness um, as to some of these issues. And you know, there's, there's different ways to try to get at it, um, to try to have someone, you know, show video or otherwise go into a facility, um, go through records virtually. But I will say, too, there's the flip side of it is that the willingness to use video conferencing and increase video conferencing is actually helpful in some ways because you see um, you can observe reactions that, you know, if it would have been a conference call with 30 individuals without video before, I think the potential 
um, and not just the potential, but the tendency of parties to automatically turn on their cameras and when they get on Teams or on Zoom is really helpful. And also, um, it's allowed for some more candid conversations uh, than I've seen in other times and kind of crossing the time zone boundaries a little better. So I think it has both effects. Yeah, it also does have the benefit, right, of you can get started sooner, right? You don't have to assemble your team and get everybody on site. You can sort of start the next day with intro kickoff calls over Zoom calls that you would have needed, you know, three or four days to organize schedules and travel and and get things, slower to get things going. I know we have probably 30 seconds left, but Jack or Michael, anything to add in terms of recent experiences with COVID? Michael, go ahead. If you have anything, actually, I I, I have not had a ma- any major issues in that respect. But uh, you know, I think uh, it, I think the major co- co- problem that and Jack would uh, echo this is that re- you really, when you look at quality issues, you really need to get into the plants. Right. 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 Yeah, I mean, right. we we've done uh, like you know many of our uh, uh, colleagues and firms in the in the space. People had to do a pivot, right? And uh, we've we've done a successful pivot, um, but they're in perfect methods and vehicles. So, um, right. you know, I think we, we all know that looking somebody in the eye, getting a sense of trust and veracity from their statements, you know, it it, it is diminished over over Zoom. Uh, it's not eliminated. So, uh, you know, you could do your best and there are proxies and ways to do it. But but um, for for high risk and high impact transactions, the more you can do in person and on site, the better. Okay. Well, I think we are out of time. So although there is a lot more we could talk about, I will wrap it up and turn it back over to Jen, who will probably wave us out. And thank you all for joining us and to all of the panelists for sharing your incredibly valuable insights. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, We have a quick 15-minute break, and we'll resume at 2.15.